Go on, and we'll ask Amanda uh, to, in to introduce what she does at uh, uh, Commonweal and keep us all informed. Uh, and we'll take some questions and answers after that. Over to you, Amanda. Thanks very much. So the awful last name that I have, thanks to my husband, is pronounced Bugawa. Uh, he's Swiss. And if I'd known how many times I would have to spell it after I got married, I probably wouldn't have changed my name. So lovely to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. I was appointed as interim director of Commonweal in February of this year. I'm not sure how familiar you are with Commonweal, so if I'm just telling you stuff that you already know, apologies in advance. My idea is that I'll just do a quick five minute overview and then answer any questions that you have. Uh, Commonweal is a Scottish based, what we call a think and do tank. And the most important things to ask when anybody tells you they're from a think tank is where does the money come from? And so I'm very happy to say Commonweal doesn't take any big corporate sponsorship or ad advertising. All of the funds that run Commonweal are small donations from people like us. Um, and that is so we can do our policy work without worrying about undue influence. <clears throat> so when we, 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 when we look at policies, we're doing it without any outside influence. So if we're looking at the environment, we're not taking money from oil companies. We're just taking money from people like us who care about the environment and therefore are willing to give us small donations to get that work going. And I think that's important. Commonweal's been going since 2014 and the volume of policy work that it's delivered since is absolutely remarkable. The reason that I was appointed this year by the board is that really this is a good time for us to be taking stock about the role that Commonweal plays in civic society. And also because Commonweal is distinctly pro-Indie, how we can support pro-independence groups with the policy work that we're doing. So if they've got questions, if you, they're being asked questions on the doorstep or on a street stand about what currency are you going to use? Well, things like that, that's where Commonweal's work can be really useful because we've done, we've written the papers, we've had senior economists come and give us their views and we've drawn together papers that have got conclusions about what would be the right thing to do. And Lynn and I were having a little show and tell of our books earlier. And one of the books that Commonweal has released is this one, which is a short guide to starting a new country. And that is absolutely about the things that we need to do after the referendum. We've got lots of plans about getting to a referendum, getting independence, but do we know what we're going to do afterwards? So that's what all of these books that are published by Commonweal, you can buy the books off our website or you can just download for free the eBooks um, because we're not doing this to make money. We're doing it to help people with the information that we can provide them. Most important, importantly, I think Commonweal's work is about creating a vision of the kind of Scotland that we all want to see. So Commonweal's strap line, if you like, is all of us first. This isn't about GDP. This is about people before profits. This is about us all having a vested interest in making our country a success. But the way that we measure success is about well-being. All of us first. Can we be a successful country if we still have child poverty? or the number of amount of drug deaths that we have, or when older people are worried about being able to get social care. That, in my book, isn't a successful country. So these are the things that we need to talk about now so that we are ready for independence. It's no use trying to have these conversations afterwards. It's really about talking about it now and about measuring the success of our society by the not by GDP and things like that, but the quality of life that's 
achievable by every single one of us. So I hope that gives you a sort of slight flavor of what Commonweal is about. We have a section on the website that we call Big Ideas. And that's where we look at things like a new Green Deal, uh, a resilient Scotland, that how we transition over the next decades so that we are truly um, a zero bay carbon zero and all of these kind of things. So I think that's probably gives you a flavor and I'm really happy to take any questions that you might have. Back to you, Lindsay. Thanks for that, Amanda. Thanks very much indeed. I have to confess personally that, that um, uh, Lynn, do you want to come in? No? Uh, I have to confess personally that uh, uh, I haven't followed Col Common Wheel for my sins very closely. Uh, my agenda is slightly different, but that's beside the point. Uh, what you've said there is ideal, and I like the slogan, all of us first. I think we could all use that. Uh, uh, but uh, never mind my uh, view of it all. I'll just go to the questions now and we'll start with Andrew. Andrew Leslie. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, <clears throat> a, a fairly straightforward question, actually. Um, I read a lot of what Commonweal does. I agree with some of it, I disagree with other bits of it. But crucially, uh, in order to have your vision realised in an independent Scotland, you have to have buy-in from the politicians. Um, and I wonder what kind of links you're setting up, not just with the governing party, but with other parties to get your ideas really front and center of what their policy proposals are. Because, you know, it strikes me slightly that you know, Com Com Commonweal is, is doing fantastic work and has been doing now for seven years. But how is that feeding through to the, the, the manifestos that are coming out thick and fast now? Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. I think that's a really good point. And it's really helpful to me because when I talked originally, I said we were a think and do tank. And the thinking bit and the creating policy papers is all very good. But what happens once we've done that is the do bit, and that is really important. So I can tell you that if you look at some of the parties' manifestos for this election, you will find common wheel ideas embedded through multiple parties. Now, that's great for us because it means that people are reading the stuff and they're listening. Part of what we do as a think tank is we do lobby politicians of all parties and work with them to develop some of our papers. So for example, the recent paper that we did um, on the reform of the care marketplace, we spent a lot of time talking with various Labour MSPs on that and they were really, really helpful. What plus working with people from the care sector themselves. So they all informed that particular paper you'll find that every one of our papers tends to have different contributors, depending on both the topic and depending on where we can generate some um, sense of urgency with, with politicians, because you're absolutely right. It's no use having policies if you don't have politicians that are prepared to put their weight behind them. So we watch very carefully about the, the things that politicians are saying and when they start talking about something like a green economy, for example, we'll make sure that they get copies of our papers on that and we'll follow up with them and we'll ask them whether they have comments on, our, on the ideas that we put forward. And we really do try and make the case that some of these things are important regardless of party politics. Commonweal doesn't have a party political affiliation at all and nor should it have because it is very much about creating a better country for us all. And Commonwealth does believe that that requires independence. Um, 
but it, in terms of the party political aspects of it, I think sometimes that can get in the way, but sometimes you have to really focus on the politicians adopting your things so that you can get some action. I hope that answered things, Andrew. You want to come back in, Andrew? No? Yes, very briefly, if you don't mind. Um, no. <clears throat> I mean, that is what you might like to call standard operating procedure for virtually any think tank. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, whether you were being sufficiently ruthless <laughs> in, <laughs> I um, think in, 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 in actually pinning these, the, the, these people down and saying, look, here is our answer and it's an obvious answer and get on and put it in your manifesto. And I'm thinking, you know, particularly about something like currency. You know, we've been debating currency since 2012 and nobody as far as i'm aware has yet come up and said definitively this is what an independent scotland will do from day one um there have been changes there have been resolutions there have been this that and the other thing um but there you know for us in yes groups this is one of the biggest obstacles oh what currency will you use it's time we had an answer on that, high time. And yes. that's what I meant about, you know, if you think your ideas are the answer, you need to be really much more ruthless in, in, in push, push, pushing them. Thank you, Andrew. I, I agree with you. And that is, so I'm currently taking the organization through this whole review, organizational review process. And I need to talk with groups like you to get suggestions like that. Because I agree with you that if we've already done the work and we've got the answer, why isn't that on everybody's lips? So I might be coming back to you, Andrew, if that's all right, and ask you for how, how you think we should be doing it. Hi, Helena. Helen? Helen? Yeah. Helene. <laughs> Um, I have a question for Amanda. Uh, we had a fantastic uh, a meeting, uh, Yes Linton meeting, early this week with uh, Gordon McIntyre Kemp from Believe in Scotland. And um, yeah, we, we got some, um, yeah, some good information from him as well. And of course, currency is also one of the things we discussed. Uh, 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 I'm honest, I haven't read through uh, the Commonweal um, uh, books uh, and information yet. I, I read some of the youth uh, information, which I thought was really interesting uh, and also good that they have such a big presence. Uh, but, but are there any uh, big differences in uh, Commonweal's thinking or outcome? Uh, with Believe in Scotland and uh, Business for Scotland. Okay, so I've known Gordon since 2000, I think it was, when I used to sit in his office and tell him that he was crazy and he should be a member of the Labour Party. And I didn't get all this independence for Scotland stuff at all. Right? So that's the personal side of it. As far as common wheels concerned, there aren't that many differences in policy because a lot of what Gordon has in his books and, and, and in his plan actually comes originally from Commonweal or Commonweal people. So Ivan McKee was a director of Commonweal before working for Business for Scotland and things like this. So there's a lot of commonality. And some of that is because, you know, it's a small country and we tend to know one another and work with one another. But it's also that there are also some very simple choices to be made. And it's not that difficult to come up with the best policy for X. So I don't think you'll find very many differences. I've got, I'm not using my Business for Scotland mug tonight, but I do have one. And I've got lots and lots of Business for Scotland posters and things like that. So I don't think you'll find very many differences between us. Yeah, no, that's fine. I just want to, be, otherwise I really had to dive into it, which I still have to do, uh, to be honest. But. It's good to know. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, right, Alison, next, and then Sheena. Hi, Amanda. Hello. 
one of the things I like about Commonweal and, you know, we talk about think tanks and I think people have got different perceptions of what think tanks are. Um, I, I think, pardon me, um, what I, I like, what attracts me to Commonweal is the fact it's about getting people thinking and socialising ideas and sounding them off people and making sure that they've kicked the tyres of things and they've looked at the solutions. And one of the things on currency, to come back to Andrew's point, is that, you know, I, I've spoken a lot with Roger Mullen about this because Ro Roger actually wrote about the Growth Commission, but not the currency bit, what everybody talks about, you know, the Andrew Wilson bit. But your currency, and I know Gordon's talked a lot about this as well, it very much depends on what you what you want for your economy. If you want, uh, you know, if you're a big exporter, you know, a strong currency is probably not ideal. So there's loads of different things. There's loads of different layers on this about what we want our relationship in Europe to be. Um, so there's lots of factors. And I think the, the most value we can add to, to the conversation is to socialize these ideas, not in a complex way, but to boil it down into a way that people understand. Because otherwise the framing of it is us reacting to a unionist argument about what currency you're gonna use and we're on the back foot. If we can take a front foot proactive approach to saying, we're discussing what kind of country we want to be, what we want our place in the world to look like, what we want our trade and our economy to look like, all these things are factors and we will decide. That's the most important thing. That's what independence self-determination is all about. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right, Alison. I think one of one of those decisions is about do you want a lot of inward investment? And so one could say the Scottish government is very keen on inward investment. But actually, the foreign money that's invested here leaves the country in profits and dividends. So is that really a good deal for us? I think the one thing you can be sure of about Commonweal on the economy is that we do not think that the Growth Commission is the right way forward. And that is about a resilient Scotland, about us looking towards a greener, maybe more local economy, if you like, where we shouldn't have to ship product halfway around the world and then ship our profits halfway around the world as well. We maybe don't want to be so big on growth but we need to be looking at resilience and sustainability and what kind of economy do we need in order to be able to support that. Yeah, I think COVID has shown that things like food security and Brexit as well and the fears of you know how we actually support our population and how we support our local industries and I think that's shown a big light on that and this is why I think a think tank like Commonweal is about opening up that conversation Whereas I think people have got a negative um, you know, connotation with think tanks, thinking it's like the Taxpayers Alliance, you know, even the Growth Commission. It seemed like you know, the Charlotte Street Partners kind of thing. It's people mm. are doing the work for you and then giving you an end result rather than you know, presenting an issue and looking at the options. And Gordon does a good job at presenting the facts that kind of art of the possible. And I think if we're going to be a grown up independent country, we have to take that responsibility and engage in that debate. I think the, the engagement and who you're engaging in with is really important. We have Commonweal local, local groups, which are unaffiliated, but basically share Commonweal ideas. Um, and they all do different things. So one group focuses very much on food poverty. Another group works very much on developing ideas and discussion groups for other groups. And so there's a lot of flexibility in what local groups want to do. One of the things that I'll be doing on the 27th of this month is we're having a, a sort of a national meeting of people from across all areas of Scotland who are involved in local groups. And that's very much talking about that, about us deciding on how we are going to engage with people going forward. What are we going to do with the mini manifesto ideas? We just put out a paper a week ago saying, eight things to talk about during the election. So how do we get the feedback from across the country in to inform us for the next bit of work that we want to do? So I think, you know, we are very much a, this fluid circle of information exchange where a paper comes out, we put it out, we wait for feedback. That then reinforces the ideas, but it also gives us new ideas to work on as well. 
that's that uh, that that idea of uh, 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 th this meeting that you're having among among all the groups. Can you make that available to us to publicise? Absolutely, I'll, I'll send that. an email to Andrew, everybody knows. We'll, we'll send it out as well. I've got a series of them. There's one right. on the 28th or the 29th, which is specifically for younger people. Um, so I'll once I've, I've, I'll send out the whole series, then people can decide yeah. which is most yeah. appropriate for them. Excellent. Uh, Sheena, you're next, and then Ruth. Double. Uh, what yeah. You? Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think that common rule are absolutely wonderful. I think all the policies they put down, <coughs> I never find that I disagree with anything. I think they're all they're all things that we want for a, a new country and a, a new Scotland. They all make sense. They all um, strive to have a more equality, which is really the thing that's mainly lacking in, in the United Kingdom is the, the, the gap between the rich and poor is getting wider and wider. And that's been shown up um, really badly uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. And it shows no sign of lessening. Um, as, as we come out of the pandemic. But um, going back to the earlier comment, I think it was Andrew, wasn't it, about um, getting your policies to be accepted, um, mainly by the SMEP, because it looks as if they're going to be in for another five years. I mean, there's lots of things that I would like to see them um, adapting. A lot of them have been common real um, ideas, including um, land value tax, uh, certainly issues looking more more into the land and doing away with council tax. A lot of the problems of poverty are to do with the very unfair tax taxation system that we have in the UK. We do, we do have powers in Holyrood now to introduce a land value tax, but there's been absolutely nothing coming out from the, the Scottish government to implement it. Um, I, did, I did hear a uh, Craig Dale, whom I'm a big admirer of, who's the policy development officer, as you know, and at Commonweal, and he was discussing the issues that he had introducing the Scottish Investment Bank. Mm -hmm. And um, the story was that he, he approached the Scottish government, uh, some politicians, and they, they, they just refuted it without really studying it or having a look at it. Uh, they just sent him away like a naughty boy and he went to the civil service uh, and they, they, they took it, had a look at it, studied it, and it was after the civil servants thought this was a feasible option to go, go ahead with, certainly to look at seriously. It went back to the, the Holyrood and then the Scottish government accepted it and we now have a Scottish National Investment Bank. So as he so, said, that was, think... a, that was a, uh, 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 an education on how you have to uh, make contacts and really persuade people um, to adopt your, 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 your ideas. But he said it was not easy. It was very, very difficult. I think worse than that, Sheena. So if yeah. you look at what our Commonweal original ideas were for a Scottish investment bank, we could sit back and just go, that's great, they're doing it. But look who they've put in charge of the Scottish National Investment Bank. Yes, yeah, well. Benny I, Higgins. I didn't want to go right? into all that. You could but, not yeah. get a more establishment figure yeah, than know, Benny Higgins. It gets worse and worse, I know. It does. I know, I know. So there's no way that the concept that Commonweal put forward of a Scottish National Investment Bank mm. is going to happen when the leadership is or the people on the board who control it mm -hmm. come from that background. Yeah. So yes, we could be lazy and give ourselves a big tick and say, "Well, we good, did a good job with that." Yeah. But actually, I don't think we did at all. I think. But, but, but you didn't have any control over who the who the the appointments were going to be. So one of the problems I think is we've got a government that doesn't want to disrupt anything too much no, at no. the moment. That's right. And that means that there will be no radical policies coming out of this government before the election. And after the election, well, I think it depends on how much pressure we put on them. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So 
that's what we, we're trying to do with our locals now. If the local groups understand the policies and can go and talk to their local MSPs or their list MSPs and can make the case across the country, we've got a lot better chance after the election of having a slightly more radical view. Because we've always had this thing about, oh, you know, independence is more important. Let's put class aside. Let's put inequality aside. Firstly, we've got to get independence, then we can look at all that. And I can get that. I sort of see that there is a way that you could put that forward. But actually that doesn't mean that we should be just accepting everything in the interim. And the best way to lobby is for people to talk to their local politicians, the ones that rely on your vote so that you can say to them, I hope you'll be supporting this when it comes up or I won't be able to vote for you the next time because they care about their jobs. Okay, that sounds good. Can we? Thanks. Move, and then, then we'll go to Lynn Mowat, please. Hello. Yeah. Um, so I, I, right. can little, I can actually add a little context to the Scottish National Investment Bank because it was my SNP branch uh, that it to um, it was my SNP Ruth. branch. Yes. Ruth, we're having trouble with your sound. Okay, I'll turn my video off. Sorry, my internet's uh, uh, my internet's pretty poor at the moment. Hang on. Um, so uh, my my. Uh, my branch, my SNP branch, took the the Scottish National Investment Bank policy to um, to conference and got it. It was passed there, uh, but I take on board many of the issues that have been raised uh, about what has happened in the process. Um, right, the, right, Ruth, Ruth, we still can't hear you properly. Right, maybe okay, I'll, maybe, I'll, I'll go to Lynn uh, first, and then you can okay. reconnect. Lindsay, can I just say that Mary McCabe's had her hand up for a while. If you could go to Mary first before me. I was going to do that till you texted me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no favours for the no favours for the minute taker. Thank you. <laughs> OK, we'll go to Mary then. <laughs> OK, sorry. Hello. Sorry, I was a wee bit late there um, coming up, but um, so I, I don't know if you, I know, I see you're talking about think tanks and the stuff to produce. Um, I mean, Commonweal is, is excellent in producing ideas all the time. And there's also the Scottish Independence Convention. They're currently churning out papers written by academics. They've got um, the first one, they're coming out at, at intervals. One was about smart borders. This is all about what we need to fix before we're independent, what we need to plan for and, and for planning for the kind of Scotland we're going to have. So there's um, smart borders, security, debts and assets, um, banking, taxation, and whether to join EFTA or EU or, or whatever. All these are individual papers produced over the last few months at intervals by the SIC. And um, we had actually Marco Biaggi at an, an SIC meeting recently, who's supposed to be, I think, in charge of furthering independence. Um, not that you really notice or, as that is harsh, I know, but anyway, we said to him, I said to him, you know, are all these academics just producing stuff in a vacuum? Why, surely, if they're serious about wanting independence, they have to plan for the kind of Scotland we're going to have and they have to widen it and bring in these think tanks who are producing stuff in their own time in, in apparently a vacuum. And he said, and, and it's not as if the, the Scottish government's producing alternatives, it's not. But Marco Biaggi said um, that they did have a group assigned to producing um ideas about the new Scotland, what we're going to be like, which of course is essential not just for planning ahead, but also for persuading people to come and vote for independence. But he said they took them all away to deal with COVID. Now, I mean, that is not an excuse. The people who are dealing with COVID are scientists, doctors, and a few politicians who are deciding how far to go in and out of lockdown and maybe a few civil servants to help them. You don't need the entire Scottish government and the entire civil service working on nothing else. I mean, I've never heard of any kind of multitasking, which, um, makes you wonder how serious they are about 
independence. And also it shows how narrow their we group is that they refer to. They're not interested in looking at, at ideas outside, even stuff that gets passed at their own conference. Sheena mentioned land reform thing. I, I pushed a resolution on that. Um, and it was another one I pushed on wage ratio legislation. Really, really hard to get it in the agenda in the first place. We're talking years. But when it got on, it got passed unanimously each time. Have we heard of them again? No. So um, I don't know how we, how we cross this over. It's not... Um, somebody, um, I can't, I can't remember who. Oh, I think it was Amanda said that people are suspicious of think tanks. I, I don't think we are really. I mean, I'm suspicious of think tanks that are paid for by the government, by the Westminster government. There's a lot of them, and they're just propaganda machines. But think tanks like okay. Commonwealth, like the Scottish Independence Convention. We need them, but we need the Scottish government to occasionally look at what they're producing. And I don't know how to get their attention. Sorry, I've said enough, but any any ideas good. to get their attention, please? That's a good one for you, Amanda. Thank you very much, Mary. I don't disagree with a word that you said. And I think I'm going to have to invite you onto my little, I'm going to call you my, my sorting hat of <laughs> influencers that can come and help us come up with a strategy for Commonweal to get the message across. Because literally after the election, we want to start seeing some changes. And so how can we pressure the new government so that we get those changes made? And if it means local people across the country standing up and making sure that their voices are heard, then that's what we've got to do. Yeah, uh, we'll come to you now, Lynn. Thanks very much. Um, my, my question seems quite, uh, team after Mary speaking there. Um, Mary's talked about how we get, how we influence those who can make the changes, but I want to take us to the other end of the spectrum where uh, you've got people like me that, that read your books and believe in your policies that have no real influence, but want to make a difference. You know, how, how do we, get um, windows that are common wheel um, promoted or, or, or a heating system that is, is going to be better for the environment. How do common wheel reach the, the people at that end of the scale? Lynn, that's exactly what we're talking about at the moment. We have a new website launching at the beginning of May which will be a lot more accessible and will have a whole load of resources like posters and things that people can download and print off at home. And we want our network of locals to expand so that people are talking about Commonweal ideas in their own village halls or, you know, in the pub when we finally get pubs back again. Um, because that's how we start this momentum going. Think, but if you think back to the independence campaign in 2014, I chaired loads of meetings in village halls. And a lot of people came along to their first one feeling quite skeptical, but you know there wasn't much else going on in the village that night. So they came along and just ordinary people talking in language that they could understand made the massive difference. That's what energized people. It wasn't having politicians telling them what they should do and how they should vote. It was actually having those local conversations with neighbors, friends, and the people in the village that you don't get on with and trying to find some common ground. Um, and that for me was part of the wonder of the 2014 campaign. And that's what we need to get going again now. Commonweal wants to be a part of that and of your national YES network, but we also want to have our role within that because we've done a lot of the thinking and the policy stuff we want to offer that up and have you guys tell us how it can best be used and what you need to do more with it okay, thanks that's, for that that's... um may i ask just yeah. another small question is there something that we can do as a group for you to spread that message amanda um 
I think what I should do is I should send you the list of the meetings that we're going to have. Yeah. These will be Zoom meetings because it'll be the end of this month into early May. We had planned last year and had to cancel because of COVID a massive Our Common Home tour of Scotland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It would be lovely if we thought, <laughs> yes, that. It would be lovely if we could do that this year. I honestly don't think it's going to be feasible. I think that planning stuff for this autumn probably won't work. Mm -hmm. But what we could do is manage a campaign nationally and ask people at local level to do their bit locally. Because at local level, I think we could still meet up and do things. Okay. And yeah. I shall be looking to West Linton for we, the the road from me. We normally <laughs> put um, links into our, our minutes and such like Amanda. Are there a couple of links that you think it would be advantageous to put? In a minute that, that goes out to the whole network. Right. So what I would like to do in terms of the website link yeah. is uh, commonweal, W-E-A-L, yeah. dot Scott. Mm -hmm. Feel free to put that in. You're okay. But it will be, it is being updated and the new site in May will be a lot easier to find stuff. Okay. But I will also send you, once I've finalised it, which will be sometime next week, the list of online meetings for people to come and discuss Commonweal in more depth. That's and great. And how they can get involved. We signed up a lot of people last year to be volunteers on this Common Home tour. And sadly, we didn't get to put them to good use mm -hmm. because we had to cancel the tour. So we want to hear from people about what they think that they can do in partnership with Commonweal um, and what they think we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. Um, and as I say, we're restructuring. So now is a great time to be looking at all of that. Thank you very much. So, sounds a busy time at Common Wheel. Uh, so <laughs> so we'll, we'll uh, go now to Ruth and after that to Andrew. Hi, okay, well, I, hope, I hope you can hear me this time. So I mentioned it's been a bit dodgy at the moment. Um, so the- uh, uh, Ruth, the... Ruth, we can't hear you. It's, right, okay, uh, sorry. I, I think... Ruth, send really, me an really email. Yeah. Okay. Amanda says, email me, me and I'll reply. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Ruth. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, thanks. Um, I really wanted to sort of <clears throat> pick up on, on, on what Mary McCabe was saying there because it strikes me that this, this, this question of getting the Scottish government not just to pay attention to Commonweal, but actually to pay attention to the Yes movement um, is fairly central. Mm -hmm. And their instinct, I suggest, and I think it's probably the same with most political parties, you know, <clears throat> they trust their in-house people first, foremost, and last. And you know, if they want policy development, right, they find some people to do a policy development committee and that gets, if you like, a fast-tracked route into any 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 manifesto. Um, now, this is not the way a new Scotland should be working. Um, it should be very much um, <clears throat> ideas coming from the grassroots on all sorts of different topics that get fed in. And Mary made the very, or maybe it wasn't just Mary, made the very valid point that the battle for a land reform policy took years to get the attention of the Scottish government. And they commissioned an excellent paper by Alison Elliott, which you may remember, and um, where is it now? Deep in the long grass. Um, there are all sorts of things that they've thought about and come up with, such as the deposit and return scheme for bottles and tins. You know, there was lots of consultation we hear it's still in the pipeline. Where is it? It should be out by now. It should be running. So this is, I think what I'm going to ask you is, is, is really quite simple. This is a, a forum for yes groups and is deliberately designed to take yes groups who all may have different opinions and feed those ideas forward. Why don't you set up a similar thing for independence-minded think tanks? 
because Commonweal, like it or not, is seen as a west of Scotland, slightly left wing um, research group. And there are other research groups. There's a European movement. There's all sorts of <clears throat> different think tanks going on. You need to get your act together because acting in concert to get those policies forward, uh, you know, united we rise, divided we fall, simple as that. That's a really interesting point, Andrew. And I think I've got two responses to it, really. Is one Commonweal's um, way of working, the methodology by which we produce our policy papers, is always by inviting other people, experts in the field, politicians, other think tanks, we've even done one with a private company, you know, so we try and get a fairly broad church, but we have to have something that represents Commonweal's approach. So there would be no point in Commonweal trying to partner with um, Fraser of Allender, for example, because our political approach are so apart. And I think that's the difference between the Yes movement and, and, the, and the think tank part, is that the Yes movement all has one shared goal. And what they want to happen, or how they want it to happen, and what happens afterwards might vary, but everybody agrees that independence is what we want. Whereas our approach to health and social care will be very different from some other think tanks. So by partnering with them, we're either diluting our policy, which doesn't help, or we are only doing work on things where we can agree. So I think that's the bit about partnering with others. But I also think that the, the strength of Commonweal is actually in local groups. So the Commonweal local groups are not that different from your yes local groups. In fact, I know in some places there's a lot of overlap where people are in both. Um, and that's really the strength because I don't know a single politician who would sit down in a surgery and tell a voter that they couldn't possibly agree with something. If, if we lobby our politicians at local level saying, I want you to sign up to support this policy and everybody's doing it. And we tell them, you know, I won't be able to vote for you unless you do. That's where we can get some traction, I really believe. It's about people power. It's not about think tanks. The think tanks just create something that the people can use. But ultimately, it's about people power. Does that answer your question? I think we'll I think we'll all agree on that one. Uh, so uh, uh, next to T and Cash, and then Joan Duncan, and then if we have time, uh, Mary McCabe, because we're ten minutes to eight now, and I was only going to allow half an hour for this <laughs> Q and A. <laughs> so, but it's really interesting, very very interesting. So uh, I promised Lindsay that I would be really quick, and I wouldn't talk for more than five minutes, and we'd just do a few quick questions afterwards because he was worried about getting through the agenda. Apologies. Well, we've got we've got, uh, we've got we've got ten minutes, and there's three one to two questions. So short questions and sort of shortish answers, please. Ian. Um, thank you very much, <clears throat> um, uh, Amanda. I'm speaking to you from Orkney. Um, um, I and, and my question, I think, will dovetail quite nicely with what you've just been saying to the last uh, question that you were provided with. Um, Orkney is very much looking at its future, regardless of whether uh, uh, anything comes off a referendum on independence and what have you. So, but we're we're already looking at, uh, you know, a green recovery and how do we use hydrogen power and how do we do things much better here. I I know people that are involved in these conversations in Orkney but I don't know who you're speaking to in Orkney. And I wondered if you could maybe let us know as a Highlands and Islands group, who you're speaking to in our respective communities and perhaps 
we could help each other as time goes on. That sounds absolutely brilliant, Ian. Are you thinking about who we're talking to on policies or just who we're connected with in the locality regardless? I know some of the people that you're connected with. In fact, the SNP's candidate, Robert Leslie, in these current elections is very pro Commonweal. And I will work with, I work with Robert. And okay. being part of the Yes movement, I'm supporting him, I'm supporting the Green candidate, I'm supporting an independent candidate as well. But what I don't know is who you're speaking to at an official level, you know, because we get papers coming in. Our own paper covers things like hydrogen's the next thing, and we've got Alf Baird lives here, and he's talking about catamarans as a way forward for shipping, and that kind of thing. But if I knew who you were speaking to, I could engage with these other people probably on a more sound footing because I would feel that if I was faced with an awkward question or mm -hmm. a really aggressive opponent, I would like to feel that I could maybe turn to you and common wheel to say, how do I deal with this? Perfect. Absolutely excellent. What we will what I'll do then, Ian, because time is short, I will pull together maybe some topic areas and some geographic areas and provide that to Lindsay for circulation. But look, this is who we work with on this area. We've, we also have short-term working groups and there is a short-term working group on en energy. I wonder whether that might be a useful place for you to spend some time. That would actually be an excellent place to spend time once the selection's over, yes. Yeah, yeah. after May the 6th. Um, let me see whether we can get you invited into that group so that you can give us an Orkney view. Lovely. I've thoroughly enjoyed this evening so far. So thank you very much for your help. Okay, stay with us, Ian. There's more to come. Uh, Joan, you're, you're, you're next. Uh, and I think we might just have time for Mary. Hi, Amanda. Go, Joan. I, I, Hello. I'm, inter I'm interested in, you know, you say that... Um, policies come before independence when um you know i, I agree with and I, I don't agree with all your policy all the policies that all common we all have um developed but um without independence how are we going to fund some of the ideas that common we'll have put forward because we, we've got a fixed budget um we're so limited in what we can do mm -hmm. um and to my way of thinking I, I i see the independence coming before some of the policies great so i hope i didn't deceive people when i'm when i was talking about what i was saying is we need to do the work before independence on policies and the way forward so that we are ready when we have those powers. However, there are also certain things where we already have the powers and some of them would be, would allow us to raise more money, but we don't have a government that has the ambition to do those things. And that's what I meant when I was saying, you know, they don't want to rock the boat. They just want to coast along, perhaps until independence. And so, there are two things that we need to be doing now. Developing the policies to have them ready for an independent Scotland. So that would be the currency thing and stuff like that. But also looking at what we can do with the powers that we have to deliver better for all of us, to put all of us first now. And if we look at the taxation system and all of the social security, we actually have not taken on all the powers that we could. So that's how we can do some of this before independence by using all of the powers that we have instead of just trying for a nice comfy ride. I'll probably get kicked out of my party now. <laughs> Never. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that, Amanda. I think, um, you know, I, I, I heard... Um, Marco Biaggi um, on, on the same night as, as Mary. And mm -hmm. to be honest, I was totally shocked by his, his, his responses because um, 
the people that they are talking to are within. They're not going out with, they're speaking to a small cabal and, you know, they need to widen it. So we need to find a way, you're quite right, we need to find a way of getting the Scottish government to do what the people want and not necessarily what big business or, um, and, and we need to get them to rock the boat because they, they've been sitting far, far too um, safe, if you like, and we need to get, get them off their butts so that they, they do what we want them to do, not what they want to do. So I hope that we see a change after the election and we, we can get the government that works for the people and not for themselves. So I think, I think that's really the question. It's about after we have given them our votes and put them into power, how do we hold their feet to the fire to make sure that they deliver on what we elected them to do? And that is a problem with democracy in most of Europe at the moment, but more so in the UK. Okay, Mary, we'll, uh, we'll come to you now and I'll go to Alison in overtime. Uh, thanks, thanks for listening to me again. I know I'm not really entitled, I've already had a, a, a big spiel, but um, yeah, it, it's just, um, I think uh, um, Amanda said, you know, um, lobby your MSPs, um, try and push them and so on, but we've actually, well, certainly somebody like myself, and I think I suspect most of you and everything, We've got very little leverage with most of our MSPs because um, we're known to be um, independence activists, sometimes over years. They know we will never, ever, ever, hell will freeze over before we'll vote for a unionist party. Um, and so the only option, I mean, we've got, you know, the Greens are kind of growing up now and we've maybe got all about there, although they're hated as much as they're loved and, and we'll just have to see how that develops. I think it's good that they're getting some rivals on the yes front, absolutely. Um, but at the moment for this election, there's very little we can do because um, there's nobody left really for us to support on the constituency vote anyway. Um, they know we're going to vote for them. I mean, for, for goodness sake, we're, we're busy putting out leaflets and doing everything we're allowed to do under COVID regulations to get them elected. So it's not going to wash if you say, if, if you don't do that, I'm not going to vote for you. You know, they're just, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, I, don't, I, I just don't know what the answer to that is. It's, I think it's probably an answer for another election further when maybe there are more yes groups more, more yes parties grown to maturity and, and offering an actual challenge um, to the SNP. Eric, how long do we wait before we get a government that responds to what how we long, How long is a bit of string? I mean, uh, there's no guarantee anywhere. There's no guarantee that by next election, by 2026, there will be other yes, yes um parties which are mature and popular and attracting the attention of the media enough to offer a challenge within the, in, the independence family. Um, this, this is a big problem and that is why the SNP is so complacent and ignoring everybody outside the wee tiny group of, of, of the elites or chosen few that they, they listen to and only, only on non-radical things, you know, bottles and stuff and yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you want to go to Ali now? And this will be the last one. Thanks, Lindsay. Just really quickly, um, I just text Amanda because the chat was off to say that I, I think everything that um, think tanks, independence think tanks who can have a common purpose in the same way that we've come together in common purpose as a grassroots you know, network, um, everything needs to be framed as transition to independence. We need to stop messing about with, we wait for a vote, then we start thinking about it. The language that's been used just now is disempowering. And I think Mary's point is a, is a good one that, you know, you can see the frustration in people. What do we do? How do we get our own way? Now, take a step out of that. We're the electorate. We're actually the ones with the power. 
you know, the politicians are there to say, serve to, at the pleasure of the electorate. So I think Scotland does tend to be pretty compliant as an electorate. We, we should literally, it is people power. We write, we phone, we email, we petition. You know, we use our people power to get things done. You know, the membership in the SNP are feeling disenfranchised, but only they can fix that. You know, only they can fix that. You know, they need to take control of their conference. They need to take control of things that they want to change because otherwise people, it'll just be the status quo. There's a concept in, in organization of um, and project management, particularly of run the bus, change the bus projects. So run the bus is what the Scottish government are doing. They're, they're in government. They have, they have responsibilities. And I think we need to look at the prism they are now in after 14 years in government, they are running the bus, they're running the country. That is very difficult to be running the bus and changing the bus and being the, you know, radical or looking at the difficult issues and being a catalyst for change. We might look at the next election 2026 and we might say by that time we might have got ourselves in order from an independent side but that's caveat that, that's assuming nothing else changes in the unionist side. They could have bricked the wall by that time with an 80 seat Tory majority constitutionally. They could also have diversified us so far from Europe our options are actually limited. You know, there's so much that's out of our control. You can only work with the variables you can actually control. So time is not, time, we can't think of things in electoral cycles. We need to say the time for change is now because all change comes from crisis. You know, to say that you wait till a global pandemic out of your control before you can even think about something like independence. We, we've had, a, we've had Tory austerity after financial crash. We've had Brexit and we've got a global pandemic. If you're not, if independence is not a result of that, it never will be a result because only change only comes, massive change comes from crisis. And, you know, resetting and the, the visions that people have, have starting to feel confident about again, of you know, common real ideas and why can't we do this? And, you know, thinking about our aspirations and, and raising our ambitions and looking to the Nordic countries and stuff, that will only happen now. In Second World War, you know, they were thinking about, you know, the social security, uh, well, the welfare state and the NHS during the war. I mean, when we'd no money and, you know, Roosevelt's New Deal was during the worst financial crisis anybody had ever experienced. So, you know, if we don't have that catalyst now, it won't happen. But we need to stop thinking electoral cycles and start using people power to push people to do what we need them to do. And think tanks, engaging, the more we can connect, the more we can network, the more powerful we are. And that is what the establishment fear. And I mean the establishment in London and the establishment in Edinburgh, to be honest. You know, status quo so, is comfortable. One of the things I just want, we haven't really touched on tonight, and I just want to emphasize, is we talk about the next 10 years as though it might take 10 years for change to happen. But with the Internal Market Act, having now been passed, if we don't get our skates on, it's gonna to be too late to do anything because yeah. Scotland won't have the powers to do anything apart from have council elections. So if that doesn't put the fire under us, I don't know what will. Exactly. Yeah. Well, on that, that burning note, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think we can we can all say thank you very much, Amanda. That was uh, really really informative. Uh, good questions, good audience, uh, and I think you've all responded quite benignly to to our Amanda. She thank you a, for being kind. It was very nice a, a, to be here. A, a great way of pre presentation, calm and collected. We can all learn. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much, Amanda. Thank you. Uh, uh, we can maybe, you're very welcome to stay with us, by the way. You don't need to go. You're more than welcome to listen to your next lecture.